Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 26 of the Gaming Rules podcast. It's been three weeks since the last podcast, but I decided that between Christmas and New Year was probably not the best time to release a new podcast, as everybody would have been busy. Plus, I was pretty busy myself doing all the usual stuff. However, I'm back now. I wanted to wish everybody a happy new year and I really hope that everybody has a good year ahead with lots of gaming opportunities. I don't have a guest on the show this week, but instead I've got a competition just because I wanted to give something away at the start of the new year to one lucky listener. So more on that later on. If you want to find me, I'm on Twitter at Gaming Rules Vids. The Facebook page is Gaming Rules Videos. The website is gaming-rules.com and the YouTube channel is Gaming Rules Videos. There's also a guild over on Board Game Geek, which is guild number 2258. Thanks as always to the sponsors of the show, Gameslaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com. What Paul has played. Well, I've actually got quite a lot of games played in the last few weeks, which is good. So I'm going to go through them roughly in order. The first one was a two-player game of Small City that I played with a friend of mine called Dan, who I thought it would be his kind of thing, as he likes, you know, Sim City and things like that. And I think this was the first game that we almost played correctly. I keep getting the rules of this game wrong. I talked about Small City quite a bit in the last podcast, so I won't go over everything again. Just to say that I actually really enjoyed the two-player game of it. Um, I thought it worked, you know, quite well, and I definitely want to play this this game again. Then at the Games Club on the Tuesday, we had a couple of games of Mysterium, which was a bit unusual. Now, the last couple of times I've played Mysterium, we won, and and we did it, and it was it was tricky, but you know we did it anyway. We played two games of Mysterium, and we failed both times. I don't quite know what was going on, whether it was something in the air or not, but on the first time we played it. I think one of the players was stuck on the first position like for the first four hours and then in the second game it was we all got stuck in the middle. It, we, maybe none of us were on the right wavelength or something like that. Now I did use the Ukrainian rules. I've talked about this before but for those people who don't know Mysterium is the uh, English language version of the game that came out last year but it was originally released in uh, the Ukraine so there's a Ukrainian version and then there was a Polish version and they've changed the rules each time. But I think, like a lot of other people, that the original Ukrainian rules are the much better rule set. I really don't like the way that the clairvoyancy tokens work in the new English version, and also the fact that at the end you're not allowed to talk to each other, which for a cooperative game, it just, it just ruined it for us. So played with the original Ukrainian rules. Now, the Ukrainian rules also differ in terms of the setup, in terms of how many extra cards you deal out. And because I'd remembered the previous games being a bit easier, I thought, oh, well, let's use the uh, Ukrainian number of cards. So I think with five of, uh, of the Psychic Investigators, I think there, may, there might have been eight cards or something like that. There was a lot more than normal. I think the English rules say six. So only one more than the number of players. Anyway, that, that made it actually quite difficult. So we had two disappointing games of Mysterium. Um, and yeah, we didn't, we didn't win either one. We did then finish the night off with a couple of games of Codenames. On the Friday night gaming, I uh, played Between Two Cities, which I talked about on the last podcast, uh, having played it at a games day and then went out and bought it. So I have bought it and I've played it since. Uh, and yeah, I'm still really enjoying that just because of the, the amount of game you get in there for such a short space of time. It just plays really nicely. And I also played Mot Tainai, which I've been told by Robert is pronounced Mot Tainai. You pronounce the two T's separately. Now, I've not had a good experience with a lot of Carl Chudik games. I respect some of the ideas in them, I think they're quite cool, but everyone I've played with three or four players just felt completely random and chaotic. And, you know, a lot of people have, have banged on about how these games are great and, you know, glory to Rome and innovation and things like that. And I tried innovation like three or four times thinking, well, I've got to like this. This is a Civ card game with some cool mechanics. But every game just felt totally chaotic and totally random, and I wasn't really in control whatsoever. Anyway, a lot of people have said that culture edit games work best with two players and do become very chaotic and random with more players. Uh, and I really liked the art style of Mutt Tainai, so uh, so I got it and, and gave that a go. And I mean, I'm enjoying playing it. In total, I've played it, I think, four or five times now, and I've, I'm comfortable with the rules. I've got the hang of the rules. The bit about things being covered is a little unusual, odd choice of wording, 
and the bit about the back orders. But I'm getting the rules right and I'm understanding them. Um, so I'm playing the game and there is a skill to it. I just, I, I, as I say, I'm not sure how much skill there is to it. It's very reacting to what cards you've got and what abilities you've got. But yeah, I'm enjoying that so far. Also played a couple of games of Inhabit the Earth. Now, the first game was a learning game for all of us. And then I have played it since, where I was teaching two other people. And Inhabit the Earth is, is actually a really good game. I did play this when it was in development, but that was like a couple of years ago. So I'd forgotten pretty much everything about it. And it does play very differently from anything else I've got. The way that the movement mechanics work are very clever. So that's Inhabit the Earth, which came out, it was Richard Breeze's game, him of Keyflower fame and all the other key games. And uh, yeah, yeah, very much enjoyed that. It's a, it's a very thinky game, uh, can be quite, I mean, the rules are, are pretty easy, but then when you've got all these cards in your hand and you're working out all the combos and when to move things and how to move them and then migrating to other continents, there is quite a lot of thinking involved in it. But yeah, I enjoyed that. On a pre-Christmas games day, which I sneaked in, we got a few games played. There were five of us. So I got out Captains of Industry that a good friend of mine, Ben, had given me earlier on in this year. I think a few of them had played it at UK Games Expo. And then Ben went and got me a copy because he thought I would be interested in it. And it is the kind of game that I would be interested in. It's kind of, um, you know, you're, you're, you're producing things. You use the resources to uh, build other things, to produce other things. But then the way that the, the, the buying and selling works between the players is actually really clever. Now, we all started off, we, we were learning the game together. So all five of us started off playing it. And by the time we were a couple of rounds in, we were all saying, this is really good. This is, this is, this is really enjoyable. We're all enjoying this. This is really interesting about, oh, I'm producing some of, uh, some of this wood and I'm going to set the price at, at eight. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, I'm going to set the price at five. So they've got to buy from me rather than him. And you get these victory points, basically, if people buy from you. It's all really clever and the way that it works. However, as the game went on, we all started to like the game less and less. And that's because it all got a little bit quirky in the end of the ages. Because the way that it works is that at the end of each round, you draw a certain number of cards from this deck, and whether you draw the right cards or not, it tells you whether the round ends. Now, you can sort of predict it, but mathematically, the game could carry on forever. So, to give you an idea, there are five cards left in this deck. Um, four of them are the farms, and one of them is the city, and, it, and you draw four cards. And if the city comes out, then the age ends. So you've got an 80% chance of it ending. But it didn't for us. And then the next time round, it didn't. So, you know, and as I say, mathematically, it could go on forever. Um, now, that's not a problem. And I can see why that's in there, that you can't predict exactly when the round is going to end or not. But the way that the selling of the resources worked on these markets was that there is, there is a demand for each type of... Uh, there is a demand in each area. So let's say the demand is eight. That means eight of the counters in that area will be bought and they'll always buy from the cheapest first. So if you've got, you know, 10 counters in there, that's fine. The, the eight cheapest will get bought and the other ones will get discarded. Now, if the round doesn't end, you basically get, everybody gets a whole load more actions, which means everybody produces, which means you'll be flooding those markets with more counters, which means everybody has to undercut each other. And what ended up happening, because you do get the victory points as well as the money if your stuff is sold, we were just absolutely swamping the markets and people were putting things at a price of zero. Because if they didn't, then somebody else would have done, all of theirs would have got sold, they wouldn't have got any money, but they'd have got all the victory points. And this happened a few times in, in the end of an age and we, it didn't break the game, but it, it really did feel very, very quirky. So I think I want to play it again, but just not sure about how that worked. Anyway, that was Captains of Industry. Only played it the once, but let's see how it goes. Also got a game of King of the Elves. Now, I've had this game for like 15 years. This is the card game version of Elfenland, which has been recently released. It's a card game. It's fairly light. It's got randomness in it, but it's a game which takes up to six people, I think, and... Yeah, it's quite nice to play at the end of an evening. So we just played that to wrap things up. On Christmas Eve, I played a two-player game of uh, Trickerian uh, with Adam, and that was really good. This is the first time I've actually played the full game. But Adam stayed over from the games day the day before, so I uh, played a quick game of that before I had to dash off to the in-laws. 
And it, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I want to play Trickerian so much more, especially now that I've explored it. I was expecting the full game to be as complex again, and I was expecting it to become a really heavy game. As it turns out, most of the extra bits that are added on are relatively simple, so it, it, it was okay. You've got the prophecy section, which, which wasn't too complicated at all. Um, you've got the dark alleys. That was the most, that was the trickiest bit. Not tricky, it's fairly simple, but every round you have these cards with text on and you've got to sort of read them to decide which ones you want to take. But getting to the higher fame levels, getting to the more advanced tricks, it, it was really good. And it was a, it was a really close game as well. Uh, then went off to the in-laws and uh, played Mysterium. Now, I've not had much success in the past at getting games played round at the in-laws. There's, there's a general tendency to, you know, play, play the old sort of classics or the, the fun, silly, boulder dash um, type games, things like that. But with things like Mysterium and Codenames, I was hoping for better success. Anyway, Vicky, my girlfriend, she's played Mysterium and she really likes it and she doesn't like playing games. So it was always going to be one that was going to be suggested at this event. And we played it after dinner on Christmas Eve and it went down really well. Um, I, w I played the ghost and I was really, really nervous the whole game. So not only am I actually trying to obviously win the game for everybody, but I'm also nervous about whether these people are actually going to like the game and things like that. And it was really tough. We did it, though, in six hours. So I think it was just more I was really nervous about it, but we were actually doing quite well. On Christmas Day, the only actual game I played was a few games of Codenames, um, teaching Vicky's parents how to play the two-player version and sort of joining in ourselves, but that, that was quite nice. Um, you know, everybody's been playing Codenames everywhere, it seems. Um, it's been really, really good looking at everybody's Christmas lists of games that they've been playing with their families and seeing Codenames in there is, is just really nice. So between Christmas and New Year, I got a few friends over and we played the Marcy case of Time Stories. So I'm not going to give any spoilers about this, so you can carry on listening if you haven't played it. Um, we did enjoy it. Again, like Asylum, there, as soon as you start playing it, you turn over some of the cards, you read some of the text and you've got a rules query, which I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but you really needed to put more effort into getting the cards checked. Everybody who's played it, well, not everybody, but most people who've played it, they turn the cards over, they read them and they go, what does that mean? That, that means it needed a bit more testing. And thankfully, uh, since I started the FAQ for the game, a number of people have played Marcy Case and they helped me out with questions that I was going to have right at the start of the scenario. So I won't say what they are because that, it, it, it's kind of a bit of a spoiler but it was a spoiler which I didn't mind knowing because it is literally at the start of the game, there was a fundamental rules question and some of the people who helped me out were actually, oh, well, I ruled it this way. Oh, well, we ruled it that way. So we did get an official answer from Space Cowboys and, and we did play it right. Anyway, putting the rules queries to one side, I really enjoyed Marty Case. I'm not saying I enjoyed it more than Asylum. I enjoyed it because it was different. There's a couple of parts about it that I didn't enjoy. One of the main sort of themes about it, I felt, was a little bit, oh, is it really that? Oh, well. And then, and then I got over it and got on with it. One of the things that I liked about it is that it was different. In Asylum, there are some puzzles, and they are puzzles. They're obviously puzzles. It's like, here is a puzzle for you to solve. In Marty's case, there are puzzles, but they're subtle puzzles. It's not, bang, in your face, here's a puzzle, you've got to solve it. It's a kind of, as, as you go on, you start realising, oh, wait a minute, yeah, we need to work this out. Ah, right, okay, yeah. And, and I felt that the main puzzle, in inverted commas, in the game was actually very cleverly done and, and, and did enjoy that. At the end of the day, it were, took us four and a half hours and that was four and a half hours of enjoyment with friends. Liked the story. I, I love the way that Time Stories works. There's another little bit that's different from Asylum that is not really a spoiler, but in Asylum, whenever you reset, you always go back to location one. In Marty case, when you do the reset, you are allowed to choose any starting location. And I know Time Stories has come in for a little bit of criticism uh, with some people saying, oh, they hate it when you reset because then you've got to spend ages going back and doing exactly the same thing over again. We've not found that. I'm not saying they're wrong, that's their opinion, and if that's what happened in their games, that's fine. 
But we did Marcy Case in three runs. And in the second run, we did things pretty different from what we did in the first run. We didn't just go back and then spend half an hour repeating what we'd already done. And in fact, I don't really think we did that in Asylum. So we did the second run in Marty Case, which I say, we, we did pretty much different things. And then the, on the third run was the one where we went, right, okay, let, let, let's try and do it in the third run. We could have possibly done it in the second run, but we're not in a rush and we wanted to sort of enjoy it and, and explore all the different places, even the ones which we knew we thought might be a dead end. So before the third run, we sat down, uh, Vicky got a notepad out, we wrote everything down and we thought about it and we thought, right, what is it we're trying to do? Where do we need to get? Where do we need to go first? And it isn't obvious because you've got all these options. So yeah, you could go here, do that and do that, which will get you this item. But then you've got to think, well, do we actually need this item? Well, hang on a minute. Yeah, well, that item would be useful, but by, by, by get to get this item, we need to go there, there and there and do this. So let's try not getting the item and do it. And, the, and it was sitting down with friends and trying to work that out and then playing it through. So that's the Marty case from Time Stories. For those people who don't know what Time Stories is in, you should really look into it. It isn't a normal type of board game. It is a play once experience. Think about it like going to an escape room. You pay your money, you turn up, you have the experience, you go home. And, you know, a lot of people are saying it's not worth that amount of money. Well, I think the expansions are like 20 quid. It was four and a half hours of enjoyment for four players. It was totally worth it. It was really good. Looking forward to the next expansion, although I am worried again that there are going to be these fundamental questions right from the start. I just think they need to spend a bit more time uh, getting the cards checked by people. So the other thing that I played on that day was Nippon. This is my sixth game of Nippon, and I, I did go back to it, despite having lost the, my previous game, because I was on a bit of a winning streak with Nippon. Anyway, I got my winning streak back, although it's not really a streak, because it was broken by Kieran on game five. Um, and I won with a score of 198, which is apparently, according to the designers, a Premier League score. So uh, Nippon, still really, really enjoying the game. Still my favourite game of, of 2015. Not that I've played them all yet. I've still not played Mombasa. Um, but yeah, that was Nippon. And then Joel taught me how to play Ashes, Rise of the Phoenixborn. That I had looked at, I had heard things about. And I wasn't sure how much I'd like it or not. And I did really enjoy it. I, I just think the production of the game, the gameplay... It's just interesting decisions. It's a fixed Magic the Gathering for me. It's, there's, there's, there's lots there. The way that the dice work is clever. The way that the card abilities work that's clever. The game comes with the six pre-constructed decks. You can construct your own decks based on the cards. Just really enjoyed that. I'm hoping Joel's going to get the expansions, but I, just, I look forward to playing that again. So that's Ashes, Rise of the Phoenix Born. And that's what I've been playing in the last few weeks. Gaming Rules News. So what have I been working on recently? Well, the main thing has been the Galaxy Trucker videos. Um, I've got three of them planned and I've managed to get two of them done. And I'm hoping to have the third one finished by the end of January. Now, I know what you're probably thinking is, why would CGE commission me to create videos for a game which is eight years old? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. The first one is one of the reasons why I like working for CGE is that a lot of companies would probably look at getting me to do a rules video for a game financially. You know, they'll say, right, we could pay Paul X amount of money to produce a rules video for this game. Are we going to sell, you know, a certain number of more copies of the game because of Paul's rules video that it makes it worth us paying him to do the rules video? And that, that's a legitimate financial decision. You know, why would they do that? Well, CGE don't view it like that. CGE view it as they've produced this game they want the players out there who've bought the game to be able to learn the game better. And they want to support the people that, that have bought the game. And I, I just think that's a really good mentality. Anyway, the other reason is that uh, this is the year when CG get back the license from Rio Grande to start publishing Galaxy Trucker themselves. So, I mean, Galaxy Trucker has been selling for the last eight years. It isn't a game which has sort of, you know, uh, only been printed once or twice. There's been, there's been regular print runs of Galaxy Trucker over the years. It is still selling and it's still a great game. So anyway, I've done those two videos. They should be going live uh, very soon. They might even be live by the time this podcast goes out. The other thing that I've been working on, uh, and this is going to be my main piece of work for January, 
is the videos for the new version of Vinyos, which is going on Kickstarter in January. Uh, it's Eagle Griffin Games that are publishing it. Vital Lacerda is the designer, and you may remember him from The Gallerist, which he also published last year with Eagle Griffin. And because they did such a great job of the production on the game, he's going with them for Vinyos. Now, Vinyos originally came out in 2010, uh, Vittel's got the rights back for the game and he's made some tweaks to the game but also he's done a new version of the game which is the uh, special 2016 vintage. It's a slightly easier version of the game. I wasn't going to use streamlined although it, it is a bit more streamlined and the game is actually going to come with both games in one. So you'll have the original version with a couple of tweaks and then you'll have this new version. The board will be double sided so you can play either copy and I've played the new version and I really enjoyed it. Now I liked Vinyos before, but there was a couple of bits about it that just felt a little bit too heavy for me. And you know, the game, the game worked and everything, but there was, oh, I just thought if it was like 10, 20% lighter, I'd enjoy it a lot more because then I wouldn't have those barriers, especially to teaching new players. And I'm happy to say that the new version fixed that for me. So I, I, I really enjoyed that. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Those videos will be out uh, for the Kickstarter campaign, which is going live later on this month. Special guest. So I said that I didn't have a special guest on the show this week, but instead I'm actually going to share with you another podcast if you want to check it out. This is the Cubist podcast, which is run by Bill Corey, who I had the pleasure of meeting, having dinner with and playing a couple of games with at BGGCon last year. Bill's recorded a short segment about his podcast, so I'll just let Bill explain it himself. Hey board gamers, want to know what games you should buy, play, forget, or burn? Then you are going to love The Cubist. Every week The Cubist has some of the smartest people from all corners of the board gaming universe join him to talk about what they've been playing, concepts they find fascinating about the hobby, and of course the infamous rapid fire segment giving the guests anxiety and the listeners a laugh or two. You can find The Cubist on iTunes or check us out at thecubistpodcast.com. Also, Milton Bradley rocks, just saying. So, it's been a while since I did a competition, but since it's the new year, I wanted to give something back to one lucky listener. Now, entering this competition is simple. You either just retweet the podcast announcement on Twitter or share the post on Facebook. Uh, if you don't have social media, drop me an email to gaming-rules at outlook.com. You get one entry into the prize draw for just sending me an email, as long as you say, this is an email to enter the competition but you get another entry into the competition if you can answer the following question correctly. And the question is, why would I in particular approve of the rule in Trickerion about who gets to be the starting player? And the winner of the competition will get £30 worth of vouchers to spend as they like from gameslaw.com. This is a joint competition. Uh, both Gaming Rules and Games Law have gone 50-50 on this. So yeah, good luck to all those who enter. Well, that's about everything. Just a quick note to say that on Podcast 27, I've got none other than Jeff Engelstein on the show. For those who don't know, Jeff does the Ludology podcast, but he's also the co-designer of Space Cadets and Survive Space Attack. If you've got anything you want to ask Jeff, please visit the BGG Guild and post a comment on there, on the appropriate thread, or send me a tweet, Facebook message, or email. Until next time, take care, and thanks for listening.